Hey everybody, welcome back to Walden Community Church. My name is David Kenny, and I'm the pastor, and we're in the middle of a series called Church Where You Live. And we're looking at church and how best to do it, because we've had a, a three-year break, right? We had a three-year break from church, and I thought, you know what, it'd just be good to reconnect, redefine what we're doing here, because I think sometimes we just go through the motions and we don't think about it, and we take it for granted. And so we're taking a couple weeks, looking at it up close, and perhaps re-evaluating what we do and why we do. So, I don't know, maybe, maybe you're like me, and maybe you were raised in the church. And, and I know one of the phrases you hear a lot or at least you used to hear a lot when you were raised in the church is, um, don't mess up your church shoes. Or, hey, it's, you know, don't forget to put, up, put on your church shoes. As an, and now as an adult, I don't, I don't have church shoes. <laughs> I and I, but I can imagine to somebody who wasn't raised in the church, they might wonder, okay, what are, what are, what are church shoes? Are they special shoes? Do they help you worship God? I mean, didn't Jesus wear sandals? Is, is church shoes an, another name for sandals? Uh, but aside from that, uh, you also had special clothes that you wore only for church, and you'd hear another phrase, uh, put on your Sunday best, right? And as I'm sure you can imagine, the early church that met in the Bible, in the book of Acts, they didn't wear bonnets, they didn't wear long white gloves, they didn't wear suits or ties. This idea of our Sunday best came from the 18th century. Uh, it began in the 18th century in a little time called the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution gave us affordable clothes. Yep, affordable textiles, mass-produced clothes. That meant that finally, the middle class could buy nice clothes. Before the 18th century, most people only had two sets of clothes. They had work clothes and they had everyday clothes. But now that textiles are becoming more affordable, middle class could now copy what they saw the rich do. And that would be dressing up. Now, as you can imagine, when something changes in the church, a lot of people resist it. And at first, famous preacher John Wesley, he tried to deter people from dressing up to church, and he insisted that the only requirement for church attendance was that you were clean, which is where the phrase, cleanliness is next to godliness, came from. If you showed up in your Sunday best at a Methodist church, they would actually turn you away. And the early Baptists taught that dressing up for church was sinful because it separated the rich from the poor. But as the middle class grew larger and developed, it became more widely accepted. And by the early 19th century, all pastors and churches had changed their tune. In 1843, Pastor Horace Burstow published an article called Taste and Fashion. And in it, he argued that sophistication and refinery were godly attributes and that Christians should adopt them. And that article became the foundation for the idea that we should honor God with the clothes that we wear. In 1846, a pastor from Virginia named William Henry Foote wrote that a church going, to, a church going people are a dress loving people. And now today, many people across America we suit up for church, and we don't even question it. So, in case you've ever wondered, uh, church shoes, that phrase, is not in the Bible. <laughs> it has nothing to do with Jesus, unless, of course, your mother ever caught you uh, playing outside in your church shoes, in which case, she'd probably make sure that you met Jesus a little sooner than you'd, than you'd hoped. Well, the good news is that today, we're not going to talk about fashion. Last week we talked a little bit about church growth, and we said that growth is something that God wants, right? But it's not the reason that we have church. Growth is a sign of health. It's a byproduct of love, but growth should never be the purpose of the church. 
Once growth becomes the purpose, then we just grow for the sake of numbers. And then people become statistics. And then church becomes business. Sadly, the church in America is growing very slowly. Right now, studies show that only 20% of our nation's churches are growing. And only 5% of growth is from new Christians, which means the rest of that growth is just Christians bouncing from one church to another. And I'll tell you what, why I think that is. And, and that's because nobody looks for a friendly church. Instead, they come to church to look for friends. When people move away and they say, oh, I miss my old church, what they really mean is they miss their friends. Because after all, why would you come to church? I mean, really? What do we, what do we have to offer? <laughs> Can't the world satisfy every longing? Can't the world satisfy all your desires? What is a, what is a person out there possibly need church for? Entertainment? Socializing? Education? I mean, Hollywood, school, Facebook, they already got you covered, right? What do I need church for? This is why, you know, my alarm goes off on Sunday morning and I reach over blindly and I, I talk myself out of going to church. Now, what am I getting out of bed for? What is one hour of church really going to do for me? The answer, I believe, is connecting through fellowship. It's maturity that takes place through discipleship. At Walden Community Church, we communicate that idea with four words, more Christians and better Christians. So let's look at fellowship. Let's look at connection. And, and, and look, I said this a, you know, a week ago, we, we could send out snazzy mailers, we could create a beautiful ad in the newsletter, we could put on a top-notch VBS, you might even uh, invite somebody to church. But the big reason why people need church is because people need connection with other people. Getting people to come is one thing, but getting them to stay, that's another. You ever been invited over to somebody else's house for dinner or for a party and then like 30 minutes in, you're already checking your watch? When is this thing over? Mentally, you've already left. You're just waiting for your body to walk out the door. You're never coming back. Look at what Jesus says in Matthew 5. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. And I'll tell you which word in this passage is super important. What, what, what word is the most important to understand? It's the word you. Because I think we read the word you in the Bible and we think, me? <laughs> But you doesn't mean me. You is plural. It means y'all, right? Y'all are the light of the world. The Bible from beginning to end is all about people. People who bring God glory. And Jesus says, all of us together, we are all the light. People need connection. They come to church to connect. But sadly, most churches are not designed to allow connecting. I mean, think about it. We all sit facing forward. Most of us are quiet during all of that. It's not really an environment that promotes connecting. In fact, studies show that most people need between four to seven friends in a church before they'll ever consider making that church their home. Four to seven. That doesn't mean a few people who say hi to them or who shake their hand. That means four to seven people who can call them by name and who remember something about them. Four to seven people who show concern for them, talk to them, and want to spend time with them probably outside the church. This is why other things that the church offers, like small groups, Sunday school, social gatherings, potlucks, 
Weekend classes, that's why they're so important to attend. Last time we read 1 John 4, no one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. The Bible says nobody has seen God, but if we, right, collectively, us, it's that word y'all again, if we get together and we love each other, then we become a physical representation of God on earth. So when we say the church exists for more Christians, it typically means through evangelism. But what happens is many people commit to Christ, but they don't end up committing to a church body. So the task of the church is to bring people to Christ, but at the same time, we need to adopt them as family. People need connection. People need community. People need community. 1 Corinthians 3 says, Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your midst? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person. For God's temple is sacred and you together are that temple. How would you have seen God in the Old Testament? Where would, where would you have gone? The temple, right? You would have gone to the Holy of Holies. That was the one place you could go to see God. But what does the Bible teach now? That you, collectively, you are the presence of God and, and that God's spirit lives in us. I mean, even a four-year-old little girl knows where God lives, right? God lives here. God lives in my heart. So if people today want to see God, then they need to walk in and see a church who loves each other and who loves them. That's why connection time and fellowship time are so important in this church. Because we should all be greeters, we should all be welcomers, we should all be smilers, we should all be shaking handers and helpers and prayers every Sunday. Because if a visitor or a seeker or a member or anyone who comes through that door doesn't see God, then we are not being his body. We are not being his light on a hill. People need community because we worship a God who lives in community, right? And we were created in his image. Galatians 3 says, So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourself collectively with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile nor slave nor free. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. When people on the outside want to know what it means to be a holy priesthood, when people look at the definition of what it means to be a Christian, they should be able to point to a church and say, that's what it looks like. Look at 1 Peter 2. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Look at the privilege that God says that you have. Once you were not even a people, and now we are the people of God. By yourself, you were nothing, but now you're a chosen nation. Together, you're a royal priesthood. To, nobody is a nation all by themselves. The church is not made up of lone rangers. God wants a people. He wants a group. He wants a nation. We are part of something so much bigger than ourselves. Israel was a nation. It wasn't one person. That was, that was God's plan, right? Listen to what Moses writes about a nation that obeys God. This is a nation that listens to God. Deuteronomy 4 I have taught you decrees and laws as the Lord my God commanded me so that you may follow them in the land you are entering to take possession of it. Observe them carefully, for this will show your wisdom and understanding to the nations. Who will hear about all these decrees and say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people? What other nation is so great as to have their gods near them the way the Lord our God is near us whenever we pray to him? And what other nation is so great as to have righteous decrees and laws as the body of laws I am setting before you today? 
Why did God establish Israel as a holy nation? God wanted people to see Israel and then to look at them as an example of God's extravagant love, as an example of his blessings. And a Hebrew in Moses' tribe would never have thought, well, I'm going to go out and I'm I'm going to do this all by myself. I'm going to go this alone. I'm going to do it solo. And there was no Hebrew in that nation that ever thought that somehow that nation owed them something. And in the New Testament church, that understanding was still there. I mean, last week we read a passage that described the early church. We can look at that again for, the, for a moment. Acts 2.44 says, All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. So whatever that looks like, whatever that sounds like, it is, at its heart, a body of people who sees the needs of the community. And, and so then the hard part for the church is this shift in mindset to move away from how can the church meet my needs to how can I meet the needs of others? Matthew 16, Jesus says, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. So if you don't believe me, <laughs> then believe Jesus. Jesus says discipleship is about self-denial. Jesus took his cross up for others. He did it for you. And so we, in turn, we take our cross up for someone else. One pastor says it like this, building community means learning to appreciate the discomfort of being with people who aren't like us. It means learning personal sacrifice. It means setting aside time in our already crammed schedules to waste our time with other people who will cramp our styles and who don't care about our personal agendas. Because I'd be willing to bet that most of the people who walk through that door for the very first time have gone through a crisis, they're looking for answers, or they're looking for friends. And so those people need to get touched. They need to be welcomed. They need to be loved. 1 Corinthians 12 says, you are the body of Christ and each one of you is a part of it. A body takes care of all its parts. A body looks out for all its members. A body protects, a body preserves, a body loves. People need community. And and so to meet those needs, then, then we need to be committed. People need commitment. Ephesians 2 says you are a member of God's very own family and you belong in God's household with every other Christian. Notice God expects me to be a member of a church family. The Bible says you are a member of God's very own family. So if God says you're a member of the family, uh, who are you to argue that you're not? So I would say every Christian needs a church family. The entire Bible is a story about community. We worship a God who lives in community. He is three in one. The Bible even begins with the words looking at Adam, it is not good for the man to be alone. And there's like 30 commands in the Bible that you can't even obey unless you're part of a local church. Now, the word church is only used four times in the Bible to refer to some general, universal sense. And we would call that the global church. And so every time the word church is is used in the Bible, it's used to refer to a very specific group of believers, just like you have at your church. And once you became a believer, you were automatically a member of the global church. Automatically. The moment you gave your life to Christ, you were in God's family. But you don't become a part of a local church until you make a choice. I know some people don't think church membership is important. There's also some people who don't think marriage is important. But both of those are about commitment. The reason why churches place a high value on membership is because membership commits me to other committed people. And if you're looking for that first step towards community, I would say your first step is membership. Because without a high level of commitment, you won't experience community. Because lukewarm commitment only leads to superficial relationships. 
And since we want to experience deep relationships, churches see membership as a way of defining who is committed. The church exists on earth for a connection through fellowship and maturity that takes place through discipleship. And so when we say that the church exists for more Christians and better Christians, that second half, better Christians, that's our way of saying people need to be discipled. People need discipling. This is where each person begins to learn the basic habits of a Christian life. The early church, again, says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship and to the breaking of bread and prayer. Titus 2, teach what accords with sound doctrine. If, if last week we said that God desires the church to grow, then as it grows, it also matures. Something you'll hear Christians ask other Christians sometimes is, hey, so how's your walk, right? How's your walk? And what that implies is you are walking, right? <laughs> like you are, you are going further down the path. You are, you're making progress. So the question there is, are you more mature in your faith this year than you were last year? Have you grown? Have you learned something? Because life is a process. You know, those of you, those of you who are parents, you've witnessed the firsthand evolution of growth and maturity in your children. And as a Christian, your faith should be the same way. 1 Peter 2 says, like newborn babies crave spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. When you first came to Christ, the Bible says you're a spiritual baby, you're immature, and we all need to go through that process to become the person of God that God wants us to be. I mean, let's go back to the question that we asked at the very beginning. Why, why even get up in the morning? It's Sunday, it's your weekend, it's your day off. Why come to church? There has to be an answer, right? All of this, all of this, all of this, it has to be for something. And I'm going to argue that the purpose of the church is to make disciples. And I'll tell you how I came to that conclusion. Let me read you a, a page out of the Bible. This is the last page in the Bible. This is John. He's describing heaven. He says, no longer will there be anything accursed but the throne of God and the Lamb will be in it, in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. John says there is no more curse. That means there's no more sin, right? There won't be sin in heaven. There's no more night, no more darkness. Sin is not allowed in heaven. So if the purpose of life or the purpose of church is just to keep you from sinning, then we should just go to heaven, right? Why not? This also says that his servants will worship him. So there's going to be worship in heaven. We're going to worship God in heaven. My guess is the worship in heaven will be greater than that of a thousand choirs here on earth. So if the purpose of church is to worship God, we're going to have better worship in heaven, so why not just go to heaven right now? This passage also says, his name will be on their foreheads. Don't you think that in heaven you'll have a better understanding of God than you do right now? Absolutely. I think in the first five minutes of heaven, you'll have a better understanding of God than you'll have ever had in your entire lifetime here on earth. So if the purpose of church is just to know God better or to know the Bible more, we'll get that in heaven. So let's just go right now. Why wait? Why go to church? It, there, if heaven is the perfect place and it's so much better and everything's gonna be so much better, the worship's better, the community is better, our knowledge of God will be better, there's no more sin, why not just go now? There has to be something that we can only do on earth that we can't do in heaven. 
Jesus says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That's the one thing we can't do in heaven. We can't make disciples. The thing Jesus charged us all to do is the work that we have left to do. If the end game of the church is worship or knowledge or sin management, then we'd be in heaven right now. No, Jesus built his church to make disciples. So there's three reasons to make more Christians and better Christians. And the first is doing life together benefits your own walk with God. It's true. Proverbs 27 says, it's iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. The goal of every church is not just to make more Christians, but also better Christians, to free each person more and more from sin and to make us more and more like Jesus. It's a process, it's a journey. Like I said, how's your walk? The plain fact is we need each other desperately. Jesus is our corporate savior. We are a y'all, right, of priesthood. So he is our community savior. And time and time again, the Bible says that Christ died for the world. Christ died for humanity so that no one would be lost. The writer of Ecclesiastes say, though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves and a cord of three strands is not quickly broken. And the best way to grow in your faith is to come alongside another and be strengthened. Second, doing life together benefits your neighbor. You know, one of the excuses I hear a lot about people not coming to church or not being involved is, you know, I don't need it. I don't feel like it. Again, the idea of church becomes personal. It's about what I get from it. We go shopping with the same mentality. We buy the things we want and it will benefit us. In fact, one of the number one reasons people give for leaving a church is, I wasn't being fed. But for a true, a, a, a true church to be a community, we have to be invested in the lives of someone else, in our neighbor. On the night of his betrayal, Jesus said, you call me teacher and Lord and you are right, for so I am. If I then your Lord and teacher have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you the example that you should also do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. And if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Do you see Jesus' words? Jesus says, I have given you an example. Of what? Humility, service, doing for others. Nobody washes someone else's feet for their benefit. A little further down, Jesus says, a new command I give you, love one another, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. And by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Loving one another was not a new command. The new part was, as I have loved you. The standard for our love for each other should be Christ's standard. The, the John who recorded these words wrote his own words a little later on, and he said, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. Paul writes in Romans 14, let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual, mutual edification. Can we honestly say that we are all making our best effort to live in community, to love our neighbor, to know and to be known, to break bread, to discern the scriptures, to cry with the broken, to shoulder the weak, to strengthen the body, Doing life together benefits the work of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 12 says, For we were all baptized by one Spirit so as to form one body. Whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, we are all given the one Spirit to drink. Again, this idea, we come together as one, under the benefit, under the direction of the Holy Spirit. Where, where do you exercise your spiritual gifts? 1 Peter 4 says, Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. Where do you exercise hospitality? Where do you practice discernment or giving or leadership or mercy or service or teaching or administration or helps or knowledge or wisdom? 
evangelism, martyrdom, missionary, shepherding, faith, healing. Where do you give back what God has given you? Because you can't do it alone. Doing it alone is not church. Rather, a church is made up of people who admit that they can't do it alone. God does his greatest work through the network, the body. I'm sure you want your church to grow. No matter what size it is, I want our church to grow. I do. But any church is already too big to connect with people one-on-one -on, -one on a typical Sunday. So in order for us to be able to know one another and to allow ourselves to be known by one another, the large group has to break up into smaller groups. And this is why I would encourage you to think about small groups, to begin to have groups of study and groups of fellowship meet in homes. Now, we're coming up on summer, but the fall is typically a season of returning, of going back. Summer is coming, when it comes to an end, it'll be time to go back to work. And I know many of you have summer plans. Many of you are excited to get away this year. But after summer, let's resolve to start thinking about bringing small groups back or dinners and homes. For the next two weeks, we've been saying that we want to be the church where we live. And it needs to begin where we live, in our homes. Last week, I encouraged you to go home and to pray for your house, room by room, to pray. How can this house be used for the kingdom? Pray about that with your family. Could your home become part of the church? Could it be a place to connect as a small group with other members from church and to share the importance of Scripture and to live as one? So in the coming weeks, we'll start putting together a plan and we'd like you to be part of it. So be thinking about a day of the week that works best for you. And if you think you can help with hosting or facilitating, think about that too. The goal of the church is more Christians and better Christians. And it's all time for us to be that body of believers, that community, that light on a hill. It is all time for us to pick up our cross, and to follow. Let's pray together. Lord, once again, it is your Son that shows us the example of humility and service and love. Your Son never went anywhere alone, and yet he hung out with a group of people. He poured into those who were closest to him. He shared his life with them, and they knew him beyond just the title of teacher or master, they knew him as friend, and he knew them. Lord, it was always your plan that your church continue to be that group, that community, that place where we would feel loved, that place where we would be known, and where we would have the opportunity to use our gifts to help others. Lord, help this church, help every church, to be a place of community, to be a place of fellowship, to be a place of love, to shine like the light on a hill. No church is perfect because people aren't perfect and churches are made up of people. But help us to remember why we're here, why we get up in the morning, why we come. That's not just for us, it's for our neighbor to love them, to reach out to them, and to show them the love of Christ. Amen. Hey, well, we're so thankful that you're here, that you uh, could enjoy a couple minutes here with us today. Of course, I want to remind you that church, right? <laughs> the physical church is here. We are here in Walden. We are here every Sunday. We have two services, one at 930. It's our traditional service, and we have a choir. We sing all of your favorite hymns, and then we have a service at 11, which is our contemporary service. That is where we have a worship band, and it's a little more relaxed. Please come as you are. We also have a full program for kids from preschool all the way up through high school, 
and we also have youth group that meets every single Wednesday at six o'clock. That means all through the summer, we have youth group at 6 p.m. You can send your kids over on their bike or their skateboard. We will even feed them dinner and we will send them home to you in about an hour and a half. Call the church or email us if you have any questions, especially about Vacation Bible School coming up that we would love to have you guys sign up for. Space is limited, so please sign up for that soon. I will see you guys next time. Bye.